My friend uh, Chris Voss of The Chris Voss Show told me, man, you got to listen to these new speakers. And uh, I've never had a speaker. Well, that's not true. We visited Harmon uh, way back and had a few interviews with some of their engineers. They make JBL and stuff like that. But uh, here we have Manitou. And we're going to talk about speakers and marketing and whatever else comes up. <laughs> and, uh, it's called Manitou, and uh, it's a different interview today. Who are you? Hi, Robert. I'm Gary Gesulshin, one of the co-founders of Vanitu. Vanitu is a Seattle area company that specializes in speakers and audio electronics. Uh, we make what I think is arguably the finest sounding speaker system for your desktop and for streaming music around your house. A little bit about me, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, my background is in vibrations and audio. I built my first pair of speakers in high school, uh, used some old car drivers that my brother had laying around the house. That was like five years ago, right? Yeah, yeah, about five years ago. <laughs> had some stuff that my brother had laying around, I put it in a box, bought some parts from Radio Shack, which you can't buy anymore because they've changed. Uh, put the whole thing together. It didn't look like much, didn't sound like much, but it was actually better than what my parents had that came with their stereo. And I've kind of had interest in audio and speakers ever since. So. Yeah. It's a crazy world. I, you know, I worked in a consumer electronics store in the 1980s and sold uh, a wide variety of speakers and I fell in love with it, with the mm -hmm. consumer electronics field, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, you guys are in a crowded market with uh, changing distribution, right? Mm -hmm. And um, well, let's talk about the product first because then we'll talk about marketing sure. and the realities of starting a company. Because <laughs> Vanitou's, how old is Vanitou? Uh, we've been around about six years. Yeah. So we've been on the market a little over a year now. So yeah. And what makes you different? Why, why you instead of some You want to talk about the transparent one? Yeah. I'll show, you, I'll show you what we're selling. Yeah. We have a set of powered speakers. So what powered means is you have speakers that have an amplifier built in. Yeah. So what's different about us is one, that they're powered, and two, that we have a speaker that has digital inputs built right into it. Yep. That means that you can talk to any device today without going through a lot of conversions. Yeah, there's an optical right, in right here. You can come right out of uh, Apple devices like Apple TVs and Airport Expresses right into the optical. Your signal stays digital all the way through the loop, so you don't have the multiple conversions that other systems have. Keeps your signal cleaner, makes for better sound. It also means that the thing never goes obsolete because we can hook up to virtually anything. There's, there's four different inputs. There's an analog, uh, a coax, an optical, and USB. Yeah. So we talk to virtually any system, and it'll be many, many years before you won't be able to use this thing. Yeah. So it's it's got yeah. lots lots of inputs. Lots now of these aren't these aren't like the logic. You know, you, you go to Fry's or something, and you see all these Logitech uh, speakers that are like fifty dollars, hundred dollars. Yeah. This is in the five hundred dollars. It's in five hundred dollar range. Yeah. There's yeah. a big big difference in performance in sound quality. You know, we're aiming at the low end of the audiophile market, the high end of the consumer market. You know, yeah. We're really aiming at kind of the same customers that buy bows and beats. Yeah. It's, it's kind of that strata of customers who want better performance and all the run-of-the-mill stuff and are willing to pay a little bit of premium to get it. Yeah. You know, we think we deliver very, very high value for the dollar. Now, I, I have a couple, uh, a couple in my house and they have really good sound mm -hmm. and fairly good bass for this kind of uh, size. Right? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have a subwoofer in there, does it? It does not have a subwoofer in it. It, yeah. it has a thing on the back here called a passive radiator. Some people have looked at this and thought, gee, there's a subwoofer on there. Yeah. It's actually a device that when I push on the woofer in the front, you can see it move. Yeah. It's all in the same air chamber. That basically helps get the bass out of the unit. And so I don't know if, I don't know if you know frequency numbers, but we play flat down to 48 hertz, okay. which most speakers this size go to about 80. Yeah. So we're almost a full octave lower than most speakers this size. So it gives you, we sat down at the beginning of the company and listened to lots of different things and said, you know, Music doesn't sound like music without bass. Yeah. You've got to have bass in it to really sound well, like music. Certainly the kind of music uh, I like to listen to now. <laughs> kind of music most of us like. You, you need well, to I don't know if you line, like EDM so. music. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. But the stuff that I listen to, it needs a bass line too. You know, yeah. classic rock and things like that. So yeah. really good bass performance. If that's not enough, we actually have a subwoofer output built into the thing. So it can drive a powered subwoofer. When you plug it in, we cut the bass out of it so it doesn't have to work so hard. Reroutes the bass to the sub. Even better sound. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of flexibility. Uh, and, and it comes as a stereo pair. You're, there are two speakers. Yep. Most of the things that we compete with have just a single box unit. And they sound pretty good, but they're really all about convenience. You can't, unless you sit your head right in front of one of those, you don't get stereo. 
<laughs> you know, if you want stereo, you need one here, you need one there. Yeah. And so a real stereo pair, great sound, uh, lots of flexibility, kind of an obsolete proof design. That's, that's what we bring to the party. Yeah. Well, you know, I wanted to talk to you because uh, you're an entrepreneur trying to build something that's existed for, I don't know, dozens of years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and the, and the distribution's changing, right? We, we used to yes. go into small little uh, stores and listen to speakers like where I used to work. And now those stores are gone. Mm -hmm. Most of the buying behavior now is either in a big box store, which you have to convince a committee at right. Best Buy to put you in there, or it's on Amazon and where I don't get to listen to listen to the speaker and I, I so I have to uh, rely on marketing to tell me what what is a good product you know so our our approach to that was yes you rely on marketing but the marketing that we want you to rely on is what others are saying about it yeah. uh, you know as a small company we don't have the resources to blast out a message like a Bose or a Beats right yeah. we, we can't or we hire can't, a celebrity. we can't do mass media or, or hire a celebrity yeah so what we've counted on instead is getting a loyal user base that's willing to share their experiences with others uh, probably the thing that, that personally makes me the most proud about what we've done is our reviews on Amazon. I don't, I, I, I can't say with a straight face that I know that we're the most highly reviewed product that is on Amazon, but I can say with a straight face that it'd be darn hard for anybody to be better. Uh, out of the user reviews we have right now, we have a 4.95 star rating. Yeah. We have something like 58 five star reviews and only three that are four stars. Yeah. So it, people get on and write the nicest things. You know, they buy these, you know, they buy these things, they spend their money, and then they take their time to sit on and tell other people about how great they are. Uh, so, Which is, you know, I, it, since I did my book, and it's published by Amazon, mm -hmm. if you don't have those reviews, it, it, you're done. Because yeah. <laughs> that's the new store. Right. You know, you walk in the store, and if, if one pair of speakers has 100 reviews, and this pair only has two, you're not buying the one right. that only has two, right? And so that was, that was really our approach to how to get our name out there as a small company, was to start out with users and the professionals. Yeah. We have about a dozen reviews online from professionals who see all kinds of audio equipment, and they get our speakers in, and they're impressed with them. You know, they, their, their reviews are much like the user reviews on Amazon. They have nothing but nice things to say. It's like, wow, these things are really good. They sound great compared to the competition. They're, they're well built. You know, one of the things that really impresses people is how heavy they are. Yeah. You know? you, uh, open one up and sh show us what, what's we, in You have that pair that shows you what they look like. Yeah. This pair shows you what's inside. Yeah. Uh, the first thing that people notice when they pick them up is they're heavy. Yeah. Uh, this unit weighs way. about 12 pounds. Part of that is the fact that there's a real wooden box. It's not plastic and it's three quarters of an inch thick and it's solid wood. Uh, heavy is not great if you want to carry things around, but if you want good sound, heavy is where it's at. You, your box is not supposed to vibrate, it's just supposed to sit there. One of the reasons inexpensive speakers don't sound good is they're made out of cheap cabinets and the cabinets vibrate and you're hearing the cabinet, not the speaker. Yeah. That's great if you're violin, it's not so good if you're a speaker. Yeah. The bass technology we use, we gave it a name, we call it clear bass. And it really is a combination of three things. We have a very big woofer. You can see this, this woofer weighs about five pounds. Yeah. Most products that, uh, that are in our category would have a woofer that weighs about a pound. We have a huge magnet on this thing and it allows this woofer to have a long travel and stay really well behaved. Uh, that's combined with the internal amplifier, and the internal amplifier is 60 watts a channel, so it's got lots of oomph to push the music out. And there's a digital signal processor built into the amplifier, yeah. so we have the ability to control the signal and boost it up a little bit in the bass very precisely so the bass remains flat. And then there's the passive radiator that I spoke about earlier that's on the back of the unit that really helps get the bass out of it. Yeah. So those combinations of technologies really give it some oomph. So the things that people notice first and foremost is things heavy, they plug it in, they listen to it, and it's like, wow, that's got, that's got some real bass. They don't yeah. expect that out of this little box because they've never heard that before. Yeah. Uh, when I, and you're covering all the same stuff. I visited Harmon and met with their engineering teams, and they talked about, you know, we, we buy drivers. Uh, they have a certain uh, behavior, and mm -hmm. they know that, that behavior. And then they're able to do a lot of stuff with the DSPs right. to really change how the sound comes out. If you have control of the amplifier, then you can do a lot stuff of things. stuff you didn't have when, in, back in high school. You did didn't you? have that. I didn't have that in high school. You didn't have that until about 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's only been fairly recently that the signal processing ability has been there at a cost-effective basis where you could do something like this. Yeah. Uh, you can less, actually less separate the, the sound out and amplify travel or bass differently or change the change what it's doing with the bass. And, well, it, and you can extent, probably even change as I turn the volume up, right? Because yes. at low levels, the speaker behaves differently than yep. at high levels, right? And that's actually, in, in the fact, the DSP is used for the controls we have in the back. The volume and the bass and treble controls actually run through the DSP. 
So they control all that in the digital domain. They don't cause any distortions. Nice, very clean control of it. And uh, the bass and treble knobs, we know how to make a speaker that sounds good just sitting there, right? But the question is, where is sitting there? Yeah. Pe pe people put speakers in different locations. And you can't design a speaker to sound good in every location. Because when you get near a wall, you get a lot of extra bass out of the wall. It gets a little boomy. How do you control that? Well, you don't with a normal speaker because you don't have any controls on it. Here we have the, the bass and treble controls built into the speaker, and they're really there to account for room placement. Yeah. If you put them on your desk and your desk is out and you open, you're probably going to leave them straight up. If your desk is up against a wall, you can turn down the bass a little bit. Uh, and of course, everybody has a different sense of what sounds good to them. Yeah. So it allows you the ability to tailor to your tastes. So. Yeah. It's interesting. I, it, before the cameras came on, we were talking about Sean Olive, who works at Harmon and uh, really has done a lot on understanding how people listen to music or listen to speakers. Mm -hmm. And uh, he found that when you put them in a blind, double blind uh, listening room, they tend to like the flat speaker the best, yes. you know, whether it's, in other words, it's flat from bass to treble, right? Yes. Um, and a lot of people think that they want more bass, but they actually, actually prefer when you put them in that double blind uh, listening room, they actually, prefer the flat one. The things, Do you things, find the same thing? Or? Yeah, you know, the things that everybody does first time they get a subwoofer is they plug it into their system, they turn it way up and it's like, oh, the whole room is shaking. Now, well, listen, that's so cool. And after a little while, it's like, oh, that's too much. And they keep turning it down. And finally, they find that, gee, you don't need to rumble the whole room to have a accurate bass. You want to hear you want to hear instruments sound like they were meant to sound, but that doesn't necessarily mean shaking the room every time something comes on. Yeah. And that's true. You talk about Sean Olive, he and his mentor, Floyd Toole, Floyd Toole literally wrote the book on what sounds good in a speaker. Uh, he had a 40 year career of studying through blind tests, you know, how a speaker measures and then what do people think of what it sounds like. Yeah. And we took his book and we actually followed his advice. We, you know, we have measurements where we set these things up in space and measured them at 72 points all the way around in big circles to understand the overall frequency response to these things. So it, it's pretty well thought through design and per what you said earlier, people like flat, they're very flat. They're within a couple dB from 48 hertz up to 20k. Yeah. So, how, how do you find all the parts for this for uh, building a hardware product like this? You know, we the engines that are driving the, the speaker are, yeah. come from one place, and the DSPs come from another. Uh, you know, we in my previous career we worked with a lot of vendors who built parts for you, right? So yeah. the idea of dealing with vendors and even overseas vendors was never very intimidating to us. We sat down at the beginning of this, we wrote a nice spec for everything we wanted because we weren't going to build our own factory. We were going to go to somebody else to have them turnkey it to our specifications. We sat down and talked to a guy from Minneapolis whose father started the company on the GI Bill after World War II, yeah. a speaker company. He's built as about the last speaker company in the U.S. We showed him what we wanted and he looked at it and said, you know, I could build this thing for you, but I'd buy half the parts out of Asia and then I'd be too expensive. You may as well go there. So we actually went to we got quotes from a couple of companies in Asia and ended up in China. There are about 10 companies in China that build somewhere around 75% of the speakers in the world. Big OEM speaker companies, that's all they do is just speakers, not other yeah. electronics. We ended up at one of them. We had, a, we had a list of what we wanted, a US, US office. We worked with a guy out of California on a regular basis. Um, we wanted somebody who could, who could do the electronics and custom build stuff to our specifications. So we ended up at a very good business partner in China and in this case, they really are a business partner. They're not just, a vent, not just a vendor for us because they do a lot of interaction back and forth with them. This speaker is actually a fair amount different than what we originally told we wanted over the course of, well, how about this and how about that? You know, every, every time a decision came up, we had a strange desire to default to, well, this is a little better quality. Let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. We had a little bit of creeping elegance, but we're very happy with, with the final result. Yeah. And, but the direct answer to your question roundabout answer to your question is actually everything comes out of one factory. Uh, the, the digital signal processor and amplifier are a chip that actually come out of a U.S. company, uh, but the Chinese business partner we have is, is one of their business partners. So they have the rights to use it and to build it into the circuitry and build everything for us. Yeah. The, the, the woofer driver, it's a patent from a guy up in, in our area in the Seattle area, uh, the factory went through about 15 iterations of woofers before we arrived at this one. They would build something and test it and build something and test it. We would get it and test it. Wasn't quite good enough yet. Uh, so we went through quite a few iterations to get where we got to. Yeah. And in fact, we did something rather unprecedented. We had, we had it working. We had the design doing, measuring the way it was supposed to and doing what we thought we wanted it to do. We sat down and listened to it and said, you know, it's, it's not good enough. It doesn't have the sound we want. And we really couldn't measure what, was, what we didn't like, but we knew there was something there we didn't like. 
and we put the whole product on hold for almost a year. Well, we went back and we understood, gee, what was different here? What, what is it that we don't like sound-wise? That's actually when we came up with the patented woofer. Uh, the patent helps improve the sound in the mid-range. We added that to it and spent about a year fixing that, and we've got it all done. It's like, you know, this is what we were looking for. Yeah. This, is, this is the product we wanted. So. It's interesting, you know, talking about speakers and going back to the 80s when I used to do speaker testing for people. Um, each kind of music is different. You know, if you play classical, you want a different speaker than if you play Skrillex. You know? <laughs> and uh, are, are you, um, you know, now that we have DSPs, are you thinking of a world where you can actually change the, um, the DSP uh, profile for different kinds of music that you can sense that it's Skrillex being played. Uh, oh, let's change the, the way the speaker works. Uh, I have to say that I haven't been thinking about that, but I have to say that I probably will be in the future. So, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, it's... Well, it's, compute lets you change yeah. the product, right? Uh, that's probably where uh, the real bleeding edge stuff is right. in speaker design. It's not the woofer anymore, uh, although the, we, there is important work to do there. I, I, the problem is you don't know what the customer I'm not sure that you can predict ahead of time what changes a particular customer wants for a certain kind of music. Yeah. One of the things we have been looking at is that there are ways to give customers access to a DSP. You know, that, that's a little dangerous. You, know, you, you, you can give them something that they can hurt themselves with. And so we have been looking at, gee, is it, does it make sense to let them get in and do some settings themselves beyond, beyond just what you do in and home? Only the, have. only the nerd cares about that, right? Only the nerd. <laughs> but but you could, you could set, come up with a system where you can plug it in and you could control yourself. Yeah. And there's some of those systems now selling in home theater. There's a, I read a review recently of about a $30,000 pair of speakers that actually has an interface that you can go in and program. And the guy who did the review was from one of the major stereo magazines. He was like, this is a really cool thing, you know? He's like... He said, at first I thought it was going to be a little intimidating, but then I started playing with it, and then he got sucked in, and he's like, oh my God, i got to stop doing this. You know, this, is, yeah. this, this, is, this is worse than social media. I can't stop. So, <laughs> This is a $600 price point. Um, you know, high-end audio gear usually starts a 1000 and up and goes way up. <laughs> way up, way up. <laughs> at, J at JBL, I saw a $130,000 pair of speakers, yeah. something like that. Um, and then uh, on the bottom end, there's you know things like fifty, hundred, mm -hmm. two hundred dollars, you know, that are for hooking into an iPad. They they generally don't sound that great. Right. Um, but like JBL just had one with a bunch of lights on it. It was it's really cool LED, and it, it's sort of fun, you know. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't sound that, all that right. great. It's not like these. Of course, it's a sixth the price. Are you thinking of going into other price points? Is that something that you can do? Yes, I mean the obvious. You know, the obvious thing is you, you have a first product. I mean, yeah. the most obvious things go larger and smaller. Um, I don't foresee us ever being in the hundred dollar price point because yeah. there's no money in it and the quality is going to stink. We have we have basically established a sterling reputation for understanding how to get sound out of a speaker, and I think anything we do is always going to be very very good for what it is. So you could, you could make a smaller desktop speaker that would sound great, maybe not as good as these or maybe not play as loud or something, uh, but it could be less expensive and, and use all the best technology to make it sound good. Uh, and then of course you can go larger. So yeah. we, we've, we've been thinking on both sides of that and some other things we can do as well. So It's hard to find a market in this, in this space because uh, speakers are something that everybody thinks they know. Yeah. I mean, I, and, and it's a brand, you know most of the speaker brands are have been around for right. dozens of years you know Bose and JBL and, and Infinity and on and on right. There's a lot of stuff's been around for a long time, but you know I think if you have good sound and good value, if you get people to believe in you, you know you you can still stand out. I mean there are it is a very crowded market. Uh, what probably a lot of people don't know is if you look at the high end of the market, that you're talking about hundred thousand dollar speakers. We know a guy in Seattle that, that has a set of speakers that he sold last year for three hundred eighty four thousand dollars. Wow. It, the high end of the market is dominated by scads of bit players. There's hundreds yeah. of companies that sell the really expensive stuff, but they make you know very few a year. Uh, we wanted to aim toward the the very low end of the high end and and the high end of, of the normal consumer grade, where people want quality. They're willing to step up and pay a little bit more for it, and they recognize that they're getting it. Yeah. We it's a very common experience for us that we put our speakers in front of somebody who says, ah, you know. Yeah, I like music, but I'm really not very picky. And they sit down and listen for a few minutes, and they get this big smile on their face. Yeah. They're like, wow, I heard that before, yeah. but I haven't heard it in a long time. And they're like, gee, I like music. This is great. You know, 
I, I love soliciting that kind of response from people. No, it's it's, great it's cool. You know, it, now that I have Spotify and other other playing streaming services, you just plug it in and mm -hmm. away you go. And it, it also hooks up to Apple TV, so you can have an Apple TV and airplay right. it over. Right. So. My my house. Uh, I'm I'm the lone Android user. My wife and kids are all Apple, so we have an Apple TV TV hooked up. Everybody comes in, they start playing their music, and they start streaming. When they're gone and I'm working, I I stream over Bluetooth, and it's all in the same set. They're all all the, all the connections there simultaneously. So I stream out of my Android over Bluetooth, they use AirPlay, and uh, everybody plays their music to, to the annoyance of each other. <laughs> that, that's gonna change the summer. I, I've seen a prototype of uh, a Sonos killer uh, ah. coming, coming this summer that uh, really lets you have a party and really do a social music experience and play different kinds of stuff off of Spotify. And that'll be, of that'll be interesting to watch because I've seen some prototypes of Sonos killers that were working and never really materialized. So well, this one's coming. Interesting to see if it really This one's from it, so. a guy who knows how to do it. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that later this summer. Uh, thanks for the speakers and uh, thanks to Chris Moss for introducing us because right. it, it is as good as he says. So right. Thanks, thank Robert. Thank you very much. Thank you.